warning, this video contains spoilers for Shadow of the Colossus. If you have not played Shadow of the Colossus, dear viewer, I highly recommend doing so before proceeding. You have been warned. Before I start this video, I just want to say, this was not something pleasant to make. But then that's kind of the point. It isn't easy to talk about the subject matter of this video, but I feel that these are topics worth discussing. Topics that do need to be addressed. I didn't expect this video to be so difficult to make because the subject matter hits a little too close to home, shall we say. I originally wanted to make this video back in January of 2018, but it took me well over three years to complete. I'm gonna drop my whole bubbly shtick for this video because it just isn't appropriate for the stuff we're going to be discussing today. With all that said, let's begin the video. Let me ask you a question, dear viewer. What's the loneliest game you've ever played? Some people may say Metroid Prime because of its dark corridors, abandoned landscape, and ambient atmosphere. Others may say Dead Space due to its strong sense of being isolated and trapped without any help. Still others may say Dark Souls due to the trepidation felt while exploring, the quiet and ambient soundtrack, and the arcane and winding lore that all come together to make for a feeling of being lost without a guide and without an understanding of who, what, or where you are. But for those of us who've played it, no list of the loneliest games of all time would be complete without Shadow of the Colossus. Shadow of the Colossus is a story about many things, but at its core, it is the story of the Boy Wander's quest to defeat 16 colossi so that he may also defeat death itself. He ventures into the Forbidden Lands and meets Dorman, a being that can grant Wander's wish to revive the girl Mono. Certainly Shadow of the Colossus is a game filled with ambiguity, but what about loneliness? Why do I say that Shadow of the Colossus is one of the loneliest games of all time? Well, let me dig a bit deeper. What makes a game feel lonely? Is it barren landscapes? Dark, empty, confined corridors? A bleak world devoid of characters to interact with? Or an almost total absence of sound save for the handful of ambient background noises? Well, as it turns out, Shadow of the Colossus has all of that. This is a world populated only by animals, plants, and the Colossi, in all their many, many shapes and forms. Loneliness isn't always easy to pinpoint, but the presence can always be felt. The long expanse of time spent traversing the vast landscape with no one to greet you does certainly evoke a sense of isolation. The uncanny silence in the overworld makes it hard not to feel the weight of isolation. And that weight is loneliness. This is why Shadow of the Colossus is one of the loneliest games ever made. Its isolation creates a deeply uncomfortable feeling that makes us wonder, where is everybody? But this isn't just a game that starts out lonely, 
It gets lonelier as the game progresses. Each time Wander kills a Colossus, the game strongly emphasizes just how destructive the death is. But it's more than simply destructive, for with each death, the world becomes just that much lonelier. And the game increases uh, Wander's life bar and stamina bar after each death of a Colossus. It rewards the player with a sense of loneliness that grows thicker as Wonder grows stronger. It goes even deeper than that. Throughout the Forbidden Lands are scattered many fruit trees and shining lizards. By consuming the fruit, one can extend Wander's life bar, and by taking the tails of shining lizards, one can extend Wander's uh, stamina gauge. By feeding off of the few wildlife in the Forbidden Lands, one makes the world even emptier and bleaker. Thus, the Shadow of the Colossus reminds us that the pursuits of power and to defy the basic law of mortals are paths that lead to a continuous spiral into abject isolation. It's a parable about blindly following authority and the dangers that arise from blind trust in said authority. It's about the ethics of desperation that leads one to seek and destroy magnificent creatures in order to fight against the inevitability of death itself. But that isn't what we're going to talk about. These issues are definitely worthy of discussion, but they're not at the core of today's video. I want to talk about how the game evokes loneliness and what that loneliness means in the context of the game. For when Wonder starts off, the world is desolate, but there are still several colossi and lizards. With each death of a colossus, a sense of doubt pervades the air. This doubt is caused by a lack of characters with whom to converse. No one can tell you that you've done the right thing, and no one can tell you when you've erred. This game evokes loneliness to force you to question your actions. The only one to keep you company is your horse, Agro. And when you get to the final Colossus Malice, you lose even her. When we finally face off against Malice, few can march toward it without an all-consuming feeling of loneliness that will haunt the player long after the journey is over. But the boss fight against Malice contains another element. Ambiguity. It uses the isolation in the boss fight to create a strong sense of ambiguity. But what's more, this ambiguity has been pervasive throughout the game for a while now, and it's what makes the game so open to interpretation. The designers don't tell us how to think or how to interpret the story. And with the ambiguity that uh, this game evokes through loneliness, they ask us to consider that our preferred interpretation could be wrong. Shadow of the Colossus asks us to think for ourselves. That's not something you see often in video games, or any other medium for that matter. And I would argue that uh, this is what makes it so special and impactful. Once you form your interpretation, you're forced to consider that you could be wrong. It forces self-reflection through isolation. This holds doubly so in the final boss fight against Malice. Malice forces us to consider, was it all worth it? 
Does saving one person really justify the slaughter of 16 colossi? By cutting us off from any other people, it leaves only our minds to answer the game's questions. This ironically makes it both direct and equally as subtle in its themes. Shadow of the Colossus is not a game for everyone. It can be difficult to deal with its empty world, and its strong focus on minimalism can make it hard for some people to stomach. But it does excel at conveying its lonely world through its magnificent art direction and lack of music. Music tells us how to feel, so its absence in the overworld prevents us from relying on the interpretation of the game's creators. The art direction creates a muddy air of uncertainty, and it all works together to destroy our sense of accountability. Until the game's ending reminds us that, even in the dark, even without the watchful eyes of others judging us constantly, our actions still have consequences. We still have to live with our mistakes, no matter how desperate or tragic our stories may be. I have a hard time thinking of any other game that's so simple in concept, yet so layered in meaning. It has one of the shortest scripts of any 3D AAA game, yet what makes it so deep is its subtext. The things it doesn't say, but implies. The loneliness in this game's old world serves as the keystone that holds together its subtext. It is as fundamental to this game's identity as fear is to a horror game. The game's undertones are easy to miss on a first playthrough, especially for a AAA game. And because of that, the meaning in the game's overtones can change vastly upon further examination. The subtext shapes the total text. So much of the world seems desolate and abandoned, and abandoned is the key word here. There were people who built structures like bridges and stone hallways. The wreckage of a civilization that forsook its home, or perhaps was wiped out. It serves to remind the player of the crippling sense of loneliness that pervades the entirety of the game. If the world is devoid of any signs of civilization, one can ignore the isolation since we're not reminded of it. But if relics of a nameless people scatter the lands, it becomes much harder not to think about just how alone one is. About the people who once trod this strange place draws attention to feelings that would otherwise be ignored by the player. Uncomfortable feelings that hint at an even darker undercurrent. Regardless of whether this forgotten civilization fled or was annihilated, this paints a bleak picture. If they fled, it means something about these lands was horrifying enough to scare away an entire people. And if they were wiped out, it means something there was deadly enough to destroy them all. In either case, it hints that maybe Wander shouldn't be here. And the ending reveals that those suspicions were right. Wander shouldn't be here. Dorman is in fact a dark god who can slaughter armies. By killing the Colossi, Wander broke the seals that prevented Dorman from crushing everyone in his way. 
Wander made his own body a vessel for an unspeakable evil. Or maybe Dorman isn't completely evil. He does warn Wander of the consequences of his obsession, and he does keep his promise in the end. More on that later. But speaking of the ending, Wander's possession by Dorman results in him growing in size. He becomes that which he fights. In one very short scene, the game conveys just how destructive Dorman's power is. But it also conveys something else. The perspective of the Colossi. It makes the player feel the same sense of loneliness that the Colossi themselves may have felt. The same feeling that you're being indiscriminately attacked. Being put in that same position as your only enemies in the game reframes your experiences as a lot less noble and glorious as you may have first thought. Make no mistake though, Wander is the aggressor. He trespassed into these lands. Every fight, even with the violent colossi, is an active choice. Many of them simply will not fight back until Wander strikes the first blow. Celosia, one of the colossi to strike at Wander before he can even make the first move, acts very tough, but when Wander picks up a torch to fight back, Celosia displays... fear. He can only pathetically paw back at Wander. This simple display of fear makes Wander seem, again, a lot less noble. Phalanx even refuses to fight back at all, choosing to avoid combat altogether. Shadow of the Colossus evokes these unpleasant emotions to deliver a complex parable. These uncomfortable feelings should have served as a warning, but the player ignored them. Perhaps one could read this as saying that even unpleasant feelings should be heeded. That they exist for a reason, but I don't want to look too deeply into that. That's not really what this video is about. I want to focus on the game's loneliness, not on all the game's narrative themes. This game's use of loneliness is absolutely brilliant because of how it relates to perspective. The isolation throughout most of the game serves partly to create the feeling of being a lone hunter. But when the perspective is shifted at the end, when Wander is possessed by Dorman, that same feeling of loneliness that hovered over the rest of the game is now being used to turn feeling like a lone hunter into feeling like the lonely hunted. The isolation this game evokes is everywhere and inescapable. Yet the way it's felt changes depending on perspective. As you might have guessed, this is not a very cheerful game. It deals with very serious subject matter, and when Wander has been completely consumed by loneliness, his future is gone. Or is it? Which brings us back to the ending. Dorman, as I said earlier, kept his promise and revived Mono. And despite everything that's happened, the game ends on a somewhat positive note. Wander, now a child, is taken by Mono to an idyllic garden, and everything moves on. Surely this must be out of place, right? I'd argue it's a very fitting ending. It reminds us that even if loneliness is inescapable, 
Each of us still has a future. As our story of loneliness ends, a different story is waiting to be told. That's surprisingly uplifting considering everything I've talked about so far, and it contributes to the game's ambiguity. This time, however, it isn't being used to erode away our sense of accountability. It's being used to get us to consider that our futures may not be as bleak as we think they are. Even Agro survives. An animal's loyalty can be a light even in the darkest of times, as I can attest. And the fact that Agro survived tells us that our true friends will never leave our sides. There's still a way forward. Clearly loneliness can go hand in hand with isolation, but what about with a large cast of characters? Can loneliness occur in the opposite of isolation? That is what we'll tackle next time, when we talk about Chrono Cross. Stay tuned for that. I hope y'all enjoyed this uh, video. It is by far the most amount of editing I've done so far. So making this uh, video has been quite the learning experience. Uh, this video was extremely difficult to make because tackling such unpleasant topics that plague so many people these days was... Well, let's just say it was an exhausting ordeal. If y'all enjoyed this uh, video, be sure to give it a like, leave a comment, Share it everywhere, and subscribe to see more of my content. This has been the Mississippi King signing out. Take care and have a nice day.